Hello everyone and welcome to the fire safety verification method webinar for fire safety practitioners. Uh, we appreciate you all tuning into this afternoon's webinar um, and I am Alexander Armstrong from the Australian Building Codes Board. Today we're going to run through three different presentations plus a Q&A session at the end. Uh, the first, of course, an introduction by myself. Then we're going to move on to an introduction to the fire safety verification method from Paul England, who is a fire engineer uh, representing the Australian Building Codes Board. Uh, next, we're on to the fire safety practitioner's perspective from FPA Australia. Um, and then we'll be going for a fire authority's perspective from AFAC. Uh, and finally, uh, we will have some Q&A. We'd appreciate for the Q&A session if you have any questions, if you could log them throughout the presentation. That will allow us to review them and respond to common trends and give us time to, to, to work through that process. Uh, learning outcomes for today, look, we're looking for people attending to develop a greater understanding of the fire safety verification method and how it involves uh, your profession. We're also looking to increase the technical understanding of how you will work with the fire safety verification method. And finally, we're looking to increase confidence um, for yourself for working on your projects for the fire safety verification method as it becomes a valid verification method under the NCC on 1 May. Now I'd like to pass to Paul England um, for his introduction to the fire safety verification method. Thank you. Um, I'll uh, brief, briefly run through some of the general principles and then go through uh, a little bit more detail uh, that's relevant to fire safety, uh, fire protection practitioners um, uh, a little bit uh, later in the presentation. So moving on. The, the um, fire safety uh, ver verification method uh, is provided in schedule two of, um, uh, uh, sorry, Schedule 7 of the Fire Safety Verification Method uh, in the NCC 2019. Uh, it becomes uh, active on the 1st of May 2020, and it provides a process for verifying compliance of fire safety performance solutions with the NCC. Uh, other options can still be used, but it does provide a, a robust uh, approach to carrying out performance-based uh, uh, solutions and demonstrating uh, compliance with the NCC. So uh, what is the purpose uh, of uh, the fire safety verification method? Well, it's to ensure the minimum level of safety required by the NCC is met using the concept of equivalence. A similar reference building complying with the DTS provisions is defined. Uh, a check uh, of the level of safety of, for the proposed building solution needs to be greater than the reference building or, or equal to the reference building. Uh, and then it's assumed that uh, uh, you're satisfying the uh, relevant performance requirements. It's a practical approach uh, that, that uh, provides a quasi quantification pending the full quantification of the performance requirements. It is a tried and tested uh, approach. Um, it's uh, referred to in the NCC, uh, so you can still use equivalence and uh, not through the fire safety verification method. Uh, it's referred to in the uh, IFEG, the International Fire Engineering Guidelines, early codes of practice put out by uh, the Society of Fire Safety in the early 2000s uh, were referencing uh, strongly uh, equivalence approaches. And it's been used for uh, major changes to the NCC, such as via uh, work performed by Vaughan Beck in the early 2000s. And uh, 140 William Street was a major project with significant changes to FRLs that was also under uh, undertaken using the equivalence. So it's not new. Uh, moving on. Um, one of the questions that sometimes gets asked is, uh, uh, are the NCC DTS provisions an appropriate benchmark? Um, the deemed to satisfy provisions have a, a, regular, a rigorously tested rationale behind them. Um, the, the BCA was originally derived from state and territory regulations, uh, uh, which were reviewed and consolidated into the first BCA in 88 
and the first uh, generally adopted version of it, which was the BCA 1990. Um, those requirements then went through a detailed review undertaken by the Fire Code Reform Centre, uh, which culminated in a performance-based uh, BCA 96. Since then, the NCC has been regularly reviewed and updated based on detailed analysis and uh, public comment. And it's open to suggestions for improvement on a, a three-year recycle. Uh, and again, any changes go through a rigorous uh, uh, system, including cost-benefit analysis and uh, impact uh, uh, on safety levels. So the, the deemed to satisfy are relatively well tested um, for, and suitable for a, a broad range of applications. Okay. Um, moving on to some of the resources that support the verification method. Uh, there is a handbook which provides detailed guidance on applying the fire safety verification methods. Uh, it's got information to assist all stakeholders involved in the P, uh, performance based design brief process, which could in, include fire safety uh, and fire protection practitioners. Uh, it identifies other relevant technical documents such as IFEG, national and international standards, et cetera, et cetera, where appropriate. And uh, it also references uh, data sheets. This is much more detailed uh, 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 information regarding uh, efficacy, reliability, and, and, and uh, the eff uh, efficacy of fire protection systems, which may be a, a, of interest to practitioners and relevance to practitioners. Looks at uh, occupant response and evacuation and also things like design fires. And it's in a form that can be regularly updated. So if you want to get into the technical aspects of it, uh, have, a, have a look at the uh, data sheets as well. So now going through some of the highlights of, uh, of the uh, fire safety verification method. Uh, one of the uh, key issues uh, when you're looking at equivalence is defining uh, a deemed to satisfy reference building. And this can uh, enter into, um, uh, shall we say, excessive wrangling and detailed discussion with difference of opinions about what, what an appropriate reference building is. Um, the um, handbook goes into a fair degree of detail about principles for selection of the reference building to really ensure that it's a relevant uh, benchmark to the particular uh, performance solution that's being uh, examined. So some of the principles include uh, uh, that the NCC DTS provisions should be fully applied and include relevant state and uh, territory variations. There are state and territory variations that can apply. So obviously it has to be for the uh, relevant state. Uh, the building should have the same footprint, floor area and volume as the proposal. Uh, it should have the same occupant numbers and characteristics as the proposal. If you start varying those things, it becomes very subjective and uh, questions can be asked about the relevance to the uh, proposed performance solution. It should have the same fire brigade response and arrival time after notification uh, um, as, as the proposal uh, for a proposed uh, fire safety uh, solution. Where there are options for fire protection measures, uh, um, and there are under deemed to satisfy uh, um, solu solutions. You can have a choice of uh, uh, options. Uh, under those circumstances, adopt a, a combination of measures based on sound engineering principles that would be expected to provide an acceptable level of safety. So don't automatically go with the lowest. Look at what would be reasonable for the type of building it is. Um, if appropriate, also include additional features that may uh, not be addressed fully uh, by the uh, NCC DTS provisions. Things like provisions for evacuation for people for disabil with disabilities and also looking at, at uh, the use of lifts. Those sorts of details should, should be reasonable for the um, DTS solution as well as the uh, proposed performance solution. Um, another key feature of the fire safety verification method is that it gives a list of, minima, of a minimum range of scenarios that should be considered. Um, other scenarios can be considered if they're relevant to uh, a particular um, uh, performance solution, but this is a check and ensures that most 
um, uh, most of the requirements are, are properly addressed. Um, some of the key issues here are uh, fire blocks, uh, um, uh, fire blocks and evacuation route. This is um, uh, sometimes overlooked and uh, very critical. Um, you've got fire starts in a concealed space, another one of those that isn't always picked up. Um, uh, fire brigade intervention is a, a, a critical aspect and uh, safety of fire brigade personnel. That's addressed in a later presentation, so I don't need to cover it off uh, in too much detail here. You've got what's normally addressed, the worst credible scenario, but you've got uh, items such as a, a robustness check, which looks at the reliability of systems. So all these things are, are um, quite important. So it provides a good checklist, but you can always add extra scenarios if appropriate. Uh, also in the um, handbook uh, and, and the fire safety verification method provides uh, pr procedural requirements. A key thing is that a performance-based design brief is mandatory. You should go through, you have to go through the process and some participants are mandated. So a client or client's representative, uh, an architect or designer, uh, fire brigade, and the appropriate authority, which is typically a, a, a statutory building surveyor or a sturdy fire, um, are absolute minimum participants. But various specialist consultants uh, can be involved in the early stages um, uh, based on a derived uh, uh, stakeholder analysis and that could include a, a range of fire uh, protection practitioners. Uh, a holistic approach is adopted, so uh, an entire building uh, uh, or reference building is compared with a, a proposed performance solution, which is an entire building, uh, rather than looking at individual variations. This makes sure that all the uh, fire safety strategy interacts in a reasonable manner. Tenability criteria are specified, and a key issue is that individual and societal risks uh, need to be considered. Okay. So now looking at the application of the fire safety verification method. Uh, the first thing is the design process. Uh, typically a design process uh, does uh, need to address uh, drivers and constraints uh, in relation to the National Construction Code. And these include safety, health and amenity, accessibility, sustainability, uh, protection of other property, but there can be a whole range of other additional drivers and constraints that relate to a, a project, such as usability, aesthetics, costs, speed of construction, building flexibility, operational continuity, corporate image, environmental protection, heritage uh, protection, workplace health and safety, other legislation, et cetera, et cetera. So these things need to be addressed now uh, fire uh, safety practitioners can end up in being involved in this design process. For example, um, coatings used to modify group numbers uh, require a, a performance solution. So uh, a supplier of those materials uh, could be involved to provide advice in relation to what the key issues are, durability of the product, uh, evidence and suitability, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you could be looking at enhancements to sprinkler systems or assume design features are required uh, as part of a performance solution. Again, you sh should really be talking about to the um, designer of those systems and installers to make sure that what's proposed is practical. Uh, and uh, looking further down the track, emergency management organization uh, could be a critical part of a performance solution facilitating uh, a prompt evacuation. Uh, sometimes these people are, are not involved at the early stage, but they should be brought on as quickly as possible in, into the process. Out of looking at these uh, uh, drivers and constraints, a proposed uh, building uh, design uh, uh, is identified, and then you need to check uh, with compliance with the NCC, which is the role of uh, fire safety verification method if it's appropriate. And uh, also they'd be checking the additional drivers, which lies outside the scope of this presentation. Um, so moving on to the next slide, uh, assuming it uh, uh, is a performance solution uh, or, or it's uh, looking at the NCC compliance, the first thing is, does it comply with the DTS provisions? If it does, 
you don't need a performance solution. Uh, in a large proportion of cases, a performance solution is required. And then you look at whether the fire safety verification method is applicable. And if it is, you proceed on to that. If not, you'd look at some other uh, uh, approaches. And potentially fire safety practitioners could be involved uh, uh, in this stage of the process. Now moving on, assuming that the fire safety verification method uh, is applied, you have uh, the performance-based design brief process to run through and the core stakeholders are there, fire safety engineers, building surveyors, emergency services, i.e. fire brigade, clients and owner or a delegate, and architect building uh, designer. But then we look at the optional stakeholders uh, and uh, I put fire safety practitioners at the top of this list and uh, basically um, they, they would be part of the stakeholder analysis to determine what is needed. And as I said before, depending on the scope, uh, there could be several fire safety practitioners that are involved. You can have other specialist consultants as well, including access consultants. I group material suppliers here separately because some of those material suppliers, uh, suppliers could be fire safety practitioners. Others may be just be supplying materials, but some requirements such as non-combustibility can still apply. Could be a peer reviewer, tenants representatives, building operations uh, uh, teams, uh, builders and insurers. So it could be a very broad list. And the fire safety verification method process you'd run through involves describing the proposed building solution and implementation plans. Again, fire safety practitioners need to be heavily involved in that process if they can be. Define reference building, uh, identify variations. This is routine process for a fire safety uh, uh, performance solution. Uh, identify variations from the NCC DTS provisions. Identify relevant performance requirements identify relevant scenarios, and identify analysis methods, inputs, and criteria for comparison. Those aren't specified, um, so providing design flexibility for the fire safety engineer and the rest of the design team. Okay, moving on. So looking at the fire safety practitioner's role, it varies depending on the type of practitioner. It may be that uh, the fire safety practitioner is the only source of detailed understanding of the performance and evidence of suitability available for a specific product or material forming part of a performance solution. And you'd be looking at talking to a product designer or the technical department if, if they're available. Uh, if a system's a key part of a performance solution, the relevant designer contractor could be involved uh, to provide input with respect to cost implications, practicality and proposed solutions. Things like sprinkler designers, detection designers, um, uh, alarm systems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, proposed members of the emergency management organization or a relevant consultant may be needed to provide advice, uh, input as to uh, ev appropriate evacuation management strategies. There's no point designing a fire safety system and then having to rely on and, and it not being compatible with the emergency management strategy. So very important those things are sorted out at an early stage. Okay, moving on. Uh, finally, at the end of the uh, process, um, uh, there will be a detailed report put together with the analysis and that should be reviewed by building surveyor, peer reviewer, the point and fire brigades, and they'll have the greatest interest in the whole report. But fire safety practitioners should be uh, reviewing if they're involved or subsequently involved to make sure the final design documentation and implementation maintenance plans uh, uh, to determine if, if they're relevant matters have been adequately addressed. And as I said before, uh, that could in, in involve practicality as well. There may be several fire safety practitioners involved depending on matters uh, under consideration. Uh, the review of the documentation should check if there is adequate information, facilitate compliance at the end of the construction, check specifications, responsibility for design implementations needs to be clearly defined, consider extension of the performance-based design brief team into verification, because that's really when some of the fire safety practitioners will become involved. And this is a rather complex flowchart. Um, just to indicate, it really indicates the complexity of the system. But if you start at the top with the blue boxes, 
Um, you come up with a building design, including implementation plans and selection of verification. That's assessed for compliance as part of the performance-based design brief process. And if the building surveyor certifies happy and peer reviewers are happy, the building surveyor will issue a, a building approvals to the builder and it moves into the implementation stage. Product supply chains become crit critical then and the product designers and manufacturers will have to produce information uh, relating to product labeling, data sheets, declaration of performance, installation instructions and evidence of suitability. So that then flows back through the building surveyor to the performance-based design brief if it's being carried through to uh, the um, final implementation stage. If not, somebody must have been de delegated to tie all that process together and liaise with the builder. And then you go through installation. And again, the product installer needs to be looking at declaration of compliance, installation, uh, schedule of installed products, et cetera, et cetera. And when you start looking at the building use and occupation, your emergency management organization and related fire safety practitioners become involved. You've also got maintenance inspection contractors uh, and consultants. So again, that comes in. So even after you've gone through the commissioning inspection and verification process uh, and the building surveyors issued the uh, building documentation uh, uh, and uh, uh, to the owners, uh, which will be an occupancy permit, but also should have details of maintenance and repair, et cetera, et cetera, that's required. That's managed by that process. And uh, basically uh, the maintenance is normally required as part of the occupancy uh, permit and of appropriate state legislation. So you can see that fire safety practitioners are involved throughout the whole process and particularly the implementation and ongoing use. So they form a critical part of a, or should form a critical part of a performance based design brief team. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I'd like to now pass along to Jeff Flower, who is from FPA Australia, and he'll be providing um, a perspective from um, the practitioner point of view on the fire safety verification method. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, to jump straight into the first slide, I guess this is uh, when uh, asked to present about the topic, uh, what's the impact of the fire safety verification methods on fire protection practitioners? You think, well, isn't this a fire safety engineering uh, matter? You know, what's the What's the big deal for our practitioners? Um, for those that might have tuned in to the um, presentation last year where Matthew Wright presented, uh, he articulated that there's uh, amongst our members and particularly the, the, the various fire protection practitioners that are involved, uh, there's probably over the years been a bit of a mistrust uh, of uh, some fire safety engineering uh, outcomes or, or the solutions that are provided. Um, and you know, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for not. Um, but I guess a big part of it's about communication because often uh, the fire practitioners aren't uh, always involved in the development of those solutions or in, 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 in uh, as Paul alluded to earlier, responsible for uh, implementation, uh, certification, ongoing maintenance and inspection and testing of those solutions and the communication isn't quite there to, for them to understand what's required uh, to successfully do that. Um, so I guess one of the key uh, outcomes from our point of view uh, in terms of the um, fire safety verification method uh, is, that, is, is it, that it's a process and it's a collaborative process. Uh, so now we've gone on to the, uh, the next slide. I, I suppose the first thing to do from our point of view is look at what the fire protection practitioners roles are uh, in, in, in building design and, and uh, generally uh, and throughout the building's life cycle. And the first one clearly is in design. So. Uh, and that's where uh, the fire protection practitioner needs to uh, document uh, the outcomes of the performance-based design report. Uh, and uh, I guess the requirement there clearly is to uh, make sure that all those required outcomes are implemented uh, is part of the, uh, the design of the building. Uh, and then can, if we go on to the next uh, part of the slide, uh, then the practitioner or practitioners that are responsible for installing it uh, can implement that successfully. So. Once again, it's got to be clearly articulated in that design uh, for the people installing it uh, as to what is required and, and maybe not so much detail as why it's required, but at least understanding that that's part of the performance-based solution and that's uh, a new form of compliance, uh, not the traditional codes and standards that the installers are used to. Uh, and then similarly, once the, the uh, system is installed, someone has to certify it, uh, 
different jurisdictions are different, but in, in many jurisdictions, in addition to, I guess, general building certification, often there is um, individual fire safety system certification. And uh, once again, unless they, those outcomes are clearly articulated, uh, we can get problems occurring where uh, the, those persons certifying it don't, aren't fully aware of the particular requirements and either things are certified in error where, where their performance-based uh, outcomes aren't included or conversely, uh, 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 an installation is um, uh, rejected, uh, even though uh, the performance-based solution includes some of the uh, variations from the normal uh, deemed to comply codes. And then finally, as alluded to, uh, we've got the inspection and maintenance. So, and this is where things often do go uh, awry, and it's, a, I guess, a larger industry issue about uh, ongoing documentation and uh, management of baseline data throughout the building's life cycle. Um, you know, probably in the, the first year after the building's built and the person who installed it's maintaining it, uh, things might be okay, but, uh, you know, give it two, three, five, ten years down the track and, uh, uh, and documentation uh, seems to have a habit in, in buildings of going missing and a person coming in to maintain that uh, building in, in, uh, in that later period of life uh, may have no idea that a, the building is subject to a performance-based uh, uh, design. Um, I guess the thing these days is, is, as I think Paul alluded to in his presentation, there are very few buildings now uh, that aren't subject to some performance-based design or another. And uh, I guess that fits back in with the um, requirement for baseline data. Uh, and one of the key elements of that baseline data would be the performance-based design report. So before we move on, oh, sorry, just quickly go back one slide, sorry, if possible. Um, I suppose just what I want to sort of finish with on that slide is that, um, we talk about the fire protection practitioner and um, uh, as you can see there, there are four main roles that the practitioner plays. And, and the thing is in that, in our uh, part of that, that industry or the, the fire safety industry is quite often, more often than not, those four roles are four separate parties. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about the fire safety engineer being involved, you know, either during installation at, at building certification and even potentially through into building operation. Uh, but that will be the same uh, fire engineer throughout that, that process. But uh, uh, we've got uh, four different parties typically in terms of the uh, fire protection practitioner's role. Uh, so there's clearly a need for good communication and, and passing documentation down through those various roles. So if we yeah, go to the next slide and, and focusing on, I guess, each of those individual roles, um, we've got the designer so um, one of the key requirements out of the fire safety verification method and, and Paul did mention uh, this before is uh, there is certainly a opportunity if not a requirement for them to play an active role in the performance-based design process uh, particularly once again uh, where um, fire safety systems are being varied from the deemed to satisfy um, and that can be both, uh, 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 I guess, what might be called a, a reduction or, or a, a dispensation from the normal requirements, but also uh, where often uh, additional um, measures are implemented as part of a performance-based design to enhance a fire safety system to uh, justify some other aspect in the building. Um, the other thing for, for all practitioners, not just fire safety practitioners, but for all, de all design practitioners is to, is to critically review the trial concept designs. Um, I guess I, we hear uh, a lot of talk in our industry, I'm just a you know, fire protection designer, who am I to question the fire engineer? I'm, I've heard it before from uh, mechanical engineers, I'm just a, the mechanical engineer, uh, the fire engineer or the building surveyor has, has asked me to do this and you know, what, what, how am I to do it? Um, what I would say is, is we're, we're all professionals, uh, we're professional designers and um, the time during that design process and through that um, uh, performance-based design brief period is to speak up and uh, uh, where, where appropriate, push back and, and question uh, the trial concept design if, if you think there are good reasons why it's not appropriate or um, that it's going to result in a, an outcome that is substandard uh, either for installation, you know, hard to install or commission or hard to uh, maintain and for, for the long term. Um, we, need to, we can help clearly identify the differences from the deemed to satisfy from the performance-based design, particularly when it gets down into not so much the deemed to satisfy provisions of the NCC, but the uh, particular provisions that are contained within the various codes and standards. Uh, fire safety engineers, are, uh, you know, that's a very broad discipline in itself and they have to be across all, all forms of uh, uh, areas where we're typically experts in our fields, we're, we're like the specialists, so the fire engineers, the, the GP. Uh, and the fire protection practitioners are typically uh, specialists in their field, whether it's fire sprinklers, fire detection, um, passive fire protection, all of that kind of thing. So 
uh, it's, uh, we, we've got the responsibility of uh, clearly identifying where there are gaps in those specific requirements. Um, and also the other, uh, as I said, for the, the designer is critical in this role in terms of passing, uh, documenting uh, the requirements of the performance-based design to pass on to the future stages. So clearly identifying specific commissioning requirements uh, and what I would call uh, evidence of compliance. So as opposed to evidence of suitability in the design, that's evidence of compliance that you have actually complied uh, with the outcome uh, required to prove that the um, uh, fire engineering outcomes have been implemented. So you know, if a, uh, a fire engineer uh, requires, uh, say, additional control valves or isolation valves in a, in a sprinkler system, uh, part of that will be documenting that those valves have been installed uh, and I guess a commissioning record for each valve uh, that can be uh, passed back to the relevant uh, either building surveyor, building certifier uh, to verify that the performance-based outcomes have been included. Um, I just want to pick up on a couple of other uh, things that uh, Paul mentioned. We talked before about the fire design scenarios. And once again, I've highlighted there uh, that the robustness check, that's probably the key area where the, the fire safety engineer, uh, fire protection engineer uh, can certainly have input into the, um, uh, the process, uh, particularly where often uh, to uh, assist that robustness process, there's a, a set of requirement for additional measures that may not be normally required in a deemed to satisfy solution. So whether it's uh, additional control valves, sometimes the um, uh, setup of the fire detection system may need to have some redundancy with, with multiple detection circuits or, or loops uh, to provide some redundancy there. Um, and once again, the, the experts in the field can certainly provide that input to the fire safety engineer to uh, give some indication of, well, one, what's feasible to do, uh, as well as what actually provides value in, in giving that level of robustness because sometimes things get specified in, in a throwaway line to say that that adds robustness when in reality we don't get a lot of uh, uh, extra value out of it. So yeah, certainly in that part. Um, and then the other point, if we go to the next slide, um, is to uh, in helping define that equivalence. So I'm um, just sort of paraphrasing uh, some of the uh, points that uh, Paul put up before, but um, he said that where there are options um, that the uh, in the deemed to satisfy for the reference building, uh, we've got to pick the we can't pick the bare minimum option. We've got to pick the option that uh, based on sound engineering principles would provide an acceptable level of safety. So once again, the fire engineer, safety engineer can certainly do some of that, but the fire protection uh, designer or engineer should certainly have some input into that, uh, particularly where uh, it can get a bit contentious. And then, as as I said before, going on to um, what additional features. Uh, may be required to address other matters. And once again, that's what fire protection engineers do. We solve fire protection problems um, and uh, certainly across the details of our system and what, what we can do to provide um, uh, a good level of safety uh, economically. So, uh, so I think that pretty much all of those cover the fire protection design engineers. If we move on to the next slide, so then we have the installer. So. Once again, the installers are typically removed uh, from the design or sometimes, you know, these days we're seeing a lot more design and construct processes, although typically before it gets to that, there's been some level of design. Um, but the first thing the designer needs to do, or sorry, the installer needs to do is clarify the performance design requirements because once again, it's not always evident um, in the um, uh, design documentation and, uh, and sometimes it's not always evident uh, that a performance-based design has been uh, applied. So the installer, uh, uh, and particularly this day and age, as I said, there's uh, very few buildings now that aren't have some level of performance design. So we should clarify what those requirements are and clarify them earlier and the key requirements and um, uh, incorporate them into a, a project quality plan uh, to ensure that they're implemented. Um, and then ultimately a commissioning management plan so that they're commissioned and commissioned uh, to achieve compliance uh, that's required for the outcome. And then finally, the handover documentation is, is paramount. Uh, once again, that's that, that communication and passing the information on to the next party. Uh, so uh, particularly, well, one, for compliance, but two, really for the installers and that, that handover documentation, the operation and maintenance manuals that clearly identify that there are performance solutions, what those performance solutions are, um, and uh, what the specific um, ongoing maintenance requirements are. And it, it's not... Uh, many, many of these kind of manuals just refer to the standard uh, Australian standard for uh, install, uh, maintenance, which is Australian standard 1851. Uh, the problem with that, of course, is that standard is written around deemed to satisfy compliance systems. Uh, and so where there is a performance-based, uh, a system to meet a performance-based outcome, uh, we need some specific requirements about what the specific maintenance measures are. 
So then finally, um, uh, I've, I've skipped over certifier because it's essentially uh, that communication to understand what it's, uh, what it's about. Uh, but then we get on to uh, the inspection, testing and maintenance of the fire uh, safety outcomes uh, for um, those practitioners. Um, unfortunately, it requires uh, a greater level of sophistication. So I guess this is a, um, a prompt for the fire safety engineers and, and the fire protection practitioner designers is that um, it does require um, the maintenance uh, personnel to understand that A, that there is a performance-based solution and B, that it is different um, than what they might normally expect. Um, the, in, uh, the maintenance practitioners need to uh, review the design and installation documentation, in other words, the baseline data, so understand what the compliance requirement of that system is. Um, if necessary, um, they should request uh, to the, per if, if it's not clear, they should request to the uh, person they're contracted to do the work for, i.e. ultimately the building owner or the system owner that they might need to get the fire engineer uh, to provide some further input if necessary. And, and particularly if there are um, uh, any aspects which may be difficult to maintain, uh, often um, particularly in operating buildings, um, it might be difficult to carry out um, invasive testing such as uh, emergency warning testing uh, or significant flow testing where lots of water will be dumped. So uh, that may require further fire engineers input into how uh, those things can be um, tested throughout the life of the building uh, without disrupting normal building operation too greatly. Uh, and then finally, um, ensuring that maintenance logs are adequate for the specific outcomes. So once again, standard log books are by their definition standard and they relate to um, tasks uh, and frequencies that are um, for normal deemed to satisfy systems, um, but uh, we, I've seen it more often than not that sometimes uh, a performance solution might rely on increased maintenance frequencies, or it might rely on checking of things that wouldn't normally be checked um, under a um, normal deemed to satisfy maintenance regime. So uh, once again, it's pretty important to make sure that the maintenance logs reflect the requirements of the um, performance-based um, design outcomes. So, um, if we summarise, uh, essentially that's the, the key outcomes. Um, I suppose the key points that I want to um, leave everyone with today from the fire protection practitioners particularly, but, but for all participants, um, is that the fire safety verification method uh, is essentially a process. And it's a process which includes all stakeholders, uh, including fire protection practitioners, but other building uh, designers and other people that need to maintain the building. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is communication. As of Hopefully I've uh, said it once, said it twice, and uh, said it now a third time. It's paramount. Uh, Two-way communication is critical. Um, fire protection practitioners need to play an active role. We can't sit back and be passive. Uh, we've got to be active in this, uh, uh, in this process and make sure that uh, uh, we, we have our say and that uh, we come up with uh, outcomes that are practical to implement and to maintain. Uh, thirdly, uh, documentation. So that's part of, I guess, that's the written communication and uh, that's uh, even more vital to make sure that that information uh, is passed down through all stages. So, yeah, right through from design, installation, commissioning, certification, uh, inspection, testing and maintenance. Um, and then finally um, is that uh, cost-effective um, solutions is the primary objective, uh, not a cheap building. So performance-based design is about coming up with safe, cost-effective solutions, not just uh, what's the cheapest thing we can build uh, and get away with, I guess, is the, uh, the attitude that uh, sometimes pervades uh, uh, what we do, not always, but uh, um, ultimately go, keeping that in the back of your mind, that community safety is the utmost um, importance in all of this. So with that said, um, that's uh, my talk. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and finally, I'll pass on to Mark Wabra from AFAC, who will be providing the fire authority's perspective on their interactions with the fire safety verification method. Great. Um, thank you, Alex, and thank you to the Australian Building Codes Board for giving me the opportunity to add a fire services pers perspective on the FSVM. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Assistant Commissioner of Community Safety for Fire and Rescue in New South Wales, as well as being the Chair of the AFAC Build Environment Technical Group. Um, which uh, tries to get fire services together and national consistency to our approach to, to fire safety issues. Um, as we've heard today, the National Construction Code will now have a requirement that the solution provided by the FSVM must now be comparable to the same building or a similar building uh, with the DTS provisions. Um, fire services do like DTS provisions because it's a degree of certainty. 
That said, um, performance has been in the Australian construction industry uh, since 1996, I think Paul mentioned. So we're in 25 years. And performance uh, is something that fire services has seen the best and possibly the worst of. Um, the FSBM must be equal to or safer than the DTS result. Uh, and that's an important thing. We do appreciate that this will require additional work uh, and reviewing and competence uh, in the practitioners that will be providing these solutions. Uh, but it will, be, uh, will enable a more informed, holistic safety comparison uh, and therefore a better result for the occupants of the building and responding fire crews. Uh, and that's an important point because the, the fire crews uh, are turning up at a building that uh, an emergency has occurred in and they want to know that they're safe in their place of work, which is what the building becomes uh, in an incident. Um, any design using the FSVM uh, will still have to go through the same approvals process with your local fire service. Uh, and that exists now for any performance solution. It's not an automatic acceptance um, and it does not have the same acceptance uh, for, as Codemark, for example. It is a requirement for the FSVM uh, to use all relevant sections of the, um, the methodology and that if any stakeholder has a contrary view or does not approve of the design or the process, then this must be documented um, and attached to the proposal when submitted for approval. Uh, at the same time as the FSVM is being implemented, uh, AFAC is also undertaking another project looking at the review of the International Fire Engineering Guidelines. Um, that's a, a welcome step from AFAC's per, uh, perspective, and we will be collaborating closely with ABCB in that particular review. Um, also, um, in preparation for the enactment of um, the verification method on the 1st of May, um, AFAC is currently reviewing the Fire Brigade's in intervention model, uh, FBIM, and that's scheduled to be released uh, to be ready for the implementation in May. Um, the FSBM is supported by all AFAC agencies. Um, we understand that it may require us to do more work. And certainly when I mentioned before about competence of the practitioners who will be dealing in this space, that includes fire services. Um, hopefully we will all lift our level of performance, uh, no pun intended, um, and that we'll, we'll be able to collaborate to get the right result for the occupants, the community, um, and the, um, the industry, and that is safer buildings. Um, although AFAC supported the, the, the FSVM, there were some um, discussions around um, some of the aspects of it, including data, um, but AFAC believes that if we all act with good faith, um, then any varying opinion, opinions can be sorted out in the fire engineering brief process. Um, the fire services are a key stakeholder, as we've heard, and expect to be involved in the process as per the NCC provisions. But the extent of the fire services involvement will be decided once a proposal is reviewed. It may be that it's something that um, we want to have a deep dive into and collaborate closely with the design team, or it may be something that we're quite satisfied with the approach being taken by the practitioners. Um, Fire services understand that the use of the FSVM is not mandatory and there are other methodologies and pathways to achieve a safe building as per the NCC performance provision. Um, regardless of the methodology used though, fire services are expecting to be consulted as a key stakeholder and we certainly look forward to working with you, as I said, to make safer buildings. Um, finally, the, currently the, the fire services around Australia and New Zealand are reviewing their approach uh, to their regulatory role. What is the future role of fire services in Australia? And that's come about partly because of the FSVM, um, but also uh, in respect of fulfilling some of the objectives of the Shergold Year Report Building Conference that was prepared for the Building Ministers Forum. Um, certainly from an AFAC perspective, this will include focusing on service delivery, national consistency, uh, but um, I'm sure the industry understands that each of the fire services operate under slightly different legislative um, requirements and therefore there may be some distance differences between the, um, the way states and territories handle it. Um, the last thing I'd like to put in a plug for is the Warren Centre project on professionalising fire safety engineering. 
I talked before about the need for all practitioners in the industry to, to be properly qualified, experienced, skilled and accredited. Um, certainly the work of the Warren Centre is helping guiding some of that conversation in our industry. So thank you for the opportunity again and I'll hand back to Alex. Thank you, Mark. We appreciate AFAC being present for these webinars and, and your input into them. Um, now, look, to, we're on to the question portion of today's webinar. Um, at this point, we haven't had any questions logged with us. Um, I'll give it an extra minute to see if any come in. Um, and in that space, I'd just like to run everyone through um, some additional resources on the fire safety verification method we have available. Now, Paul mentioned two of the main ones in his presentation, which is the handbook and their associated data sheets. Um, these are currently out in preview versions, but they will be moved to finalised versions as we move to the wards one May uh, transition date um, and the fire safety verification method becoming a valid pathway within the NCC. Um, apart from them, we also have a webinar from on our YouTube channel, which was from middle of last year as an awareness webinar. Um, please feel free to go have a look at that. That will provide you some more detail. Um, we will also have we also have a, a frequently asked questions document on our website, which provides some some input on some of the common questions we've received about the fire safety verification method across our consultation over the past twelve to eighteen months. Um, and now we're moving, sorry, into the closing part of today. Um, no questions have come through yet. We appreciate everyone tuning in, and hope this has been a very informative presentation. Um, we would very much appreciate your feedback. And on closing of this webinar, your, a link for a survey will appear. We would appreciate if everyone could fill that in and help us gather some information on how useful this is and also other support materials that may assist with the adoption of the fire safety verification method. Uh, thank you again for tuning in um, and look forward to producing some more material for you in the future.